Welcome to Life Talk with your host, the world-famous Donna Briggs. This is the most exciting show on radio. Hello, everyone. This is Donna Briggs, and you're listening to me, Donna Briggs, on Life Talk. The Big Talker, 1580 AM. I hope you guys had a great weekend and a great week so far. I did. It was pretty nice. It's nice here. Everything's going wonderful. And I'm here with my guest today, Carolyn Miller. How are you doing, Carolyn? Hi, how are you? How are you, Donna? I'm doing spectacular. Well, we're going to have a hot day here, so... Uh... Yes, it's hot everywhere. Oh, I guess. <laughs> yes. And you're the author of the book, Gothic Springs and right. Heartland, and mm-hmm. you have a new book coming out. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes, I'm excited about that. All right, they're two very different books. One's kind of an American story in the Midwest. Takes It's a kind of a growing up story of a young boy in 1939 when the world is between the tail end of the Depression and the, <clears throat> and the shadow of World War II, and it's kind of funny and poignant and all the things that growing up stories are about. Yes, I read that. I thought it was a very intriguing book. Do oh, you write full-time or do you write part-time? I didn't get that last question. Do you write full-time or part-time? Um, I, I wrote I wrote both of these books, Gothic Spring and Heartland, uh, during uh, retirement. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is this is my writing is my retirement activity keeps me keeps me out of trouble. Oh, well, that's good. So you decided to write after your retirement. I know a lot of your friends were like, "What are you doing?" Oh, you bet you. <laughs> it's very hard when you start a writing career at seventy to be taken seriously. But um, but you're doing very well. Well, the second book, Gothic Spring, is a uh, something I always wanted to write, which is a good old fashioned. Um, old Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights type of novel mm-hmm. takes place in England. I spent a couple of years in England in my youth and uh, up there in the Midlands, uh, you know, with the moors and all of that. And I thought, hmm, I think I can do something with this. So anybody likes a good old-fashioned true gothic, this is it, Gothic Spring. Yes. I, I think your books are so exciting and different. It gives you a breath of fresh air because a lot of things you notice now, especially with authors, they're writing the same type of books over and over. They're just copying each other. No one has any creativity anymore. Yes. Well, you know, don't blame the author, Donna. you got to blame the bottom line mentality that we have in this country where everything has got to make an instant profit. That's true. And and, uh, what I found is that uh, there was a conference up here just recently, and all of the agents were looking for the next Twilight or Hunger Games, you know. So part of it is really that the market just simply keeps feeding on the obvious and the known. That's true. I guess it's easier to get something that they already know it's going to work versus trying something new. Sure. I mean, how many iterations of <clears throat> Alice in Wonderland or the Batman are we going to have, you know? But it doesn't really do a lot for inviting something new. Yes, that's why I'm a really big advocate of self-publishing. Because if you self-publish, you can get your book out. And a lot of times, if you Mm self-publish, a lot of doors will open to you versus waiting for a publisher to pick your book up. Yes, that's true, and that, that is opening up there. You, now, my my two books are independent press, so mm-hmm. they're not self-published. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they've gone through the imprimatur if somebody's looked at them and decided that they'll they'll spend a little money to get them out. And for a long time, there was a real um, stigma to self-publishing, but I think that's changing again, Donna. It's the bottom line. The market is seeing that this is a whole new field, and I noticed in publishers luncheon recently penguin is going is going to open up a branch of self publishing that's great so you see it's where the money flows now the the good thing is that a lot of little new voices as you pointed out mm-hmm. m- you know might get their day in the sun the other thing is though you're going to get a lot of junk and how does the reader know what's junk how do you can you decipher yeah. A good read from something that's not really quality. And, and you know, uh, one of the things that's 
very different about books than any other form of art is that you can't judge it by its cover. Mm -hmm. You've got to buy it and read it. It's not like you walk into a store and you say, I love those earrings. You know what I mean? That's true. That's a good point. Well, I notice a lot of times now a lot of people are making their covers more inviting so people will say, let me just buy it because the cover is interesting. Cover is very important, and I notice a lot of these um, young writers are selling their books for 99 cents, and I guess Amazon's got something going where uh, for a day you can get it for free. I'm not sure how, how that works, but as they say, free is a very good price. These things are important to particularly the self-publishers or even an indie publisher mm -hmm. like myself because it means there's a lot more grains of sand on the beach. So the question is, now the shift isn't for printing and publishing a book because that's cheap. It's how do you market? That's the new. How era. do you market? Well, the, most people now are using online media uh, to market their books. Yeah, yeah. They're marketing. doing a lot of social media for marketing. Well, I want to say to your audience out there, in case there's some little fledgling out there who's got a book. Um, there are very few J.K. Rawlings out there. If you're going to publish a book, even if you've got a publisher who's going to pay for it, mm -hmm. you're still going to spend money on marketing. And the publishers don't do that for writers anymore. No, well, they don't do it for media in general. If you have a product that you believe in, you have to put your own money up and basically promote it yourself. Yeah. You, it, it, yes, it's self-promoting, which somebody like myself who spent a, quite a bit of time in the world as a politician, uh, it comes easy. But, you know, uh, ideally, r writing is kind of a, a, a individual matter, and then these young writers get out there and suddenly, okay, their book is in print, but nobody's reading it. And they have to develop a whole different set of skills to yes. get that book open. You have to know how to market. Marketing is... Is it's very important these days because if you don't market your book or anything, no one's going to know who you are, and it's just not the same platform as it used to be. Absolutely, I mean it is. Um, it's a whole new ball game when when printing became uh, accessible to everyone. When they went to the laser print or whatever this new technology is, any you know it, it costs about as maybe a thousand fifteen hundred dollars to get a book produced mm -hmm. that's almost in anybody's range um, but now all of these books are out there and 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 you've got to find your voice uh, yes because there's a market for everyone I think there is and there are you know uh, small niches and uh, fortunately with the internet if you know how to market you can find those niches or niches, or whatever it's called, and <laughs> <laughs> from a writer, how, how do I speak English? <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, yeah, but again, finding that market is tough and expensive. Yes, it's marketing is expensive. I, I have a media company, and I do production, film, radio, mm -hmm. and you have to promote yourself. Yeah, you can't be a shy vol uh, violet any longer in, in book marketing. And as I said to a, a, a couple of people that I have mentored, you know, the name of the game any, anymore isn't getting your book into print. No, because anybody could do that. Right. It's getting someone to read it. Yes. So I'll, I'll say, say if, if I put in a book, Heart Land by Caroline Miller and Gothic Spring, Two books you will enjoy out there, somebody. Well, I also realized, too, I had a, a guest on the show, and she was basically making it an important point to say that you have to have a following. Like, if you're writing a book, try to have some kind of a following so when your book comes out, people automatically buy it. That's true. And the way you do that, if anybody is interested, <clears throat> is you have to, A, use the social media, and you have to write a blog. Yes, she said that, blogging. Yeah, and blogging. if you can do video blogs, she said that's really important because that pushes your name up. Yeah. Uh, the Google search or the Yahoo mm -hmm. search. 
Yeah, YouTube is a great way to to get out there. But frankly, um, I, I think writing a blog, I write a blog five days a week, Monday through Friday, about art and literature. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's serious. It just depends. And it's no more than four or five short paragraphs because people don't have time to pay attention to anything anymore for any length of time. But and uh, and it's um, it can be found at Books by Caroline Miller. That's my website, mm -hmm. Books by Caroline Miller. And um, when you get a blog up, then you start to get a following. And uh, when you write your blog, you have to learn how to use what's called search. Engine optimization, SEO, as it's called. Yes. And uh, I'm, 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 again, I'm uh, Don. I'm talking to anybody out there who, who who thinks they've got a book they might like, right? Yes. So, I mean, this is great information. Uh, my listeners, they're doing all types of things: writing books, doing plays. So everyone needs social media. Well, you know, I've never met anyone who didn't have at least one book in them, whether they recognized it or not, because their life is a book. Yes. And everybody has a unique experience. But let me just say a moment about these SEOs. This is this is why it's, uh, I think, more important than um, even the video. Because you put these tags on the blog, mm -hmm. and then it goes out on the web. I'm like, oh, yesterday I happened to mention Tolstoy. I don't want to scare your readers off, but uh -oh. I did. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and um, no, that became a tag. So now anybody who's looking for anything on Tolstoy, my blog will come up. Well, they'll go to my blog, they'll say, uh, what has it got to do with Tolstoy? But maybe they'll stop to read it, and then maybe they'll like it. And then I've got, as you say, a follower. Yes. So the key thing is if you have a blog, try to do a video blog. And tag it with as much keywords as you can so when people <laughs> type it in, right. something comes up. You want to even attract wild elephants from Africa. You don't care just so you get an audience. Uh, so it, it, that, it really, the blog is important. And, uh, and the problem is, and I will say this to disillusion anyone, the more you start writing books and publishing the less time you have for it. That's because, true. Because you've got to do all this promoting. You've got to write these blogs. And, you know, when you get onto social media, one word of advice, mm -hmm. you do not treat people as if they were your followers. You have to take the time to get to know them and their interests. If you think you're just going to go out there and advertise your book and people are going to say, oh, Oh, I just love this book. Oh, I'm going to read. No. You would be surprised how hard it is to get people's attention. That's true. So, so the only way you're going to reach people is, is and, and I don't mean this in a phony way, because I think writers are fascinated with people. That's why we write. But allow that fascination to translate in your uh, Facebook uh, interest. I have met, I have friends actually now in Australia that I just dearly love. I've got a cadre of little Indian students in India. The whole, you know, about 10 of them are now my fans, and I'm their fans. So, um, it, as I say, it does open up the world, but it does narrow that writing time. Yes, because I'm writing a book right now, and oh. it seems like it's taking, I don't know, longer than I wanted to take because you just don't have the time. I only have six more chapters to go, but... Like, when am I going to be finished? You don't have the time. And, you know, I want to say this, Donna. I, I was a coward. You know, I went through life. I was a school teacher. I traveled around the world, for, bummed around for four years. Uh, it took a couple of advanced degrees when I got back. Uh, got into labor movements. Got into politics. I did everything to earn a living. And it was all interesting, but in my heart... I've always wanted to write. And now, you know, here I am at 70, and I'm just starting my ha-ha career. So the young people out there particularly, and, and not even at middle age, um, don't be a coward like me. 
you know, go for it. That's true. You only live once. I tell people that all the time. If you have a dream, go for it. Don't let anybody deter you from your dreams. You know, because the irony, Donna, the really irony of life is that as you get older, you really begin to find out what's important and what's not important. That's true. And what's not important is the big screen TV, the videos, the games. None of that is important. In fact, at my age of life, I'm busy giving everything away. Well, thanks so much for being with us, Carolyn. And she's the author of Gothic Springs and Heartland. And we'll be right back from a word from our sponsor. Thanks for joining me. Tune in to Biz Talk with Josh Smith, hosted by Joshua I. Smith, entrepreneur, multiple Fortune 500 board member, and former President George H.W. Bush appointee, Thursday at 9 a.m., only on The Big Talker, 1580 a.m. Please join Executive Leaders Radio on 1580 a.m. Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. to learn how to be more successful from CEOs and entrepreneurs in your area. Learn stories of success and leadership firsthand from senior executives who have been through it all. Join Real Estate 360 Live with Ryan Sloper, Mondays at 2 p.m. on the Big Talker 1580 AM. Ryan and his guests will cover every angle of real estate, from interest rates to the economy to what's happening in Washington, anything that affects real estate in the D.C. area. Want to refinance at the lowest rates in history? Call Ryan Sloper today at 877-245-2030 or leave your questions at realestate360live.com. Remember, if it's real estate, it's covered. The 9-11 memorial is for the 343 firefighters who didn't make it. It will honor my lost partners and the officers who responded that morning. It's for my brother. He was everyone's best friend. For my husband who never came home. And the first responders who saved my life. It's about hope for the future. So we always remember September 11th. It will heal our community. Show the world that we can rebuild. That we are united. And that we are strong. Because the best of humanity can overcome the worst hate. It's for all the heroes like my dad. This is Robert De Niro. This year as we open the 9-11 Memorial in New York City, we ask that you join us to honor, remember, and reunite. To learn more or to reserve your visit, go to 911memorial.org. Brought to you by the 9-11 Memorial and the Ad Council. Making sure the air in your dream home is healthy for your family to breathe. Make sure you build your home radon resistant. Preserve your family's health and well-being. To learn more, go to epa.gov slash radon. Build radon resistant. That's keeping it green. Building a radon-resistant home is easy. Just ask your builder or go to epa.gov slash radon. A message from the U.S. EPA. And now, welcome back to Life Talk with your host, Donna Briggs. We're back, and I'm here with Carolyn Miller, author of the book, Gothic Springs and Heartland. How are you doing, Carolyn? I'm still here. That's great. Now, as a child, did you want to write then, or you just decided to write when you got older? No, no, I, I, you know, I, I wrote when I was a, a, a really, yeah, since I was a child. But mm-hmm. then, you know, unfortunately, I never took myself seriously. And, and like everybody else, you know, you've got to pay for the rent. You've got to put food on the table. So I did practical things. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, no, I, I have actually <coughs> Gothic Spring is uh, I wrote when I was in my 30s. Oh, okay. And I stuck it in a drawer, <clears throat> pulled it out 40 years later. Wow. And rewrote it. And it was kind of fun, Donna, because I was actually co-writing with my younger self. And what I discovered is uh, 
a lot of my views had moderated and softened. Gothic Spring, I was, um, in the 30s, I was very active in the ERA, women's rights, you know, didn't get to the point of burning my bras. I, I'm so flat-chested, I don't need a bra. But anyway. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, so it was about, I took the Victorian period because I was interested in that very repressive period. So my her- heroine is this very talented girl who is just squeezed, has the life squeezed out of her by the mores of the Victorian society. But when I rewrote the book, one of the characters who's her nemesis is the vicar's wife, who's absolutely the cookie-cutter Victorian woman. And in my original draft, I had really satirized her, you know, as a homemaker, all of that. But when I wrote in my 70s, I softened her up and made her quite sympathetic so that um, the book gives you different views of what a woman, even in today, is going to face Mm -hmm. in her choices. And that was what the hindsight of, uh, maturity brought to the book that at 33 when I wrote it didn't matter. And people say to me, well, uh, why would anybody read your book? You know, Jane Eyre is already there. The difference between uh, Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights is that while the women, women in these books are all strong, they're strong in a Victorian mode. Yes. Okay. And I, I think that having the advantage of looking back in this age – uh, we can challenge that view of, of strength, but also soften it. So it, it was kind of fun, you know, co-writing a book with myself. That was great. Now, what was the favorite scene in your Gothic Springs book? When, I'm sorry? Your favorite scene in the book, Gothic oh, Springs? Favorite, oh, 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 my favorite scene is, <clears throat> I went back even further in time. Uh, my heroine, uh, Victorine, finds a a script from an earlier period about a romantic relationship that ends tragically between a aristocrat woman and a, a, a you know a peasant guy. A pulper. That's right. Hmm. And um, and and then I was able to write it in the more 18th century mode, and uh, I had a great deal of fun writing this really sort of dark, romantic tale in the 18th century. Mm-hmm. Well, so, it, uh, yeah, that, that scene. And I, I, you know, said she immodestly. I think it turned out pretty well. Uh, the joy of uh, writing for me, which uh, modern printing publishers perhaps don't like, is uh-huh. that you can actually dabble in a lot of styles. I have a short story out called Agent of God that has been so massively rejected because I went back and wrote an honest to true Chaucerian moral tale. And you should just put it out yourself. You already have a following. You don't need a publisher. You know, um, so uh, someday I'll find a publisher, but the point is I wanted to write a Chaucerian Yes, but you can put it out yourself now. Why Why are you holding this book back from the public? Well, it's, it's only a short story, so it's not critical. But the, the point is, um, they're not flexible. You know, one, one, one uh, publisher wrote back and said, well, the trouble with this story is that the characters don't grow. And, you know, I usually just fade into the dark when I'm rejected like anybody else and don't argue. But I had to write back. I said, dear lady, a moral tale is about virtues and the people are not people they're about good evil they don't grow they don't change they just clash Mm -hmm. and uh you know i hope the penny drop because yeah you know we uh can't forget our culture we can't forget our history and i'm talking about the rich tradition of literature Mm -hmm. no it cannot all be twilight that's true (laughs) where do you get your inspirations from where did I get my what? Inspiration. How do you get the inspirations for your books? Oh, Donna, you know, um, creativity, who can explain it? The ideas just come to me. Um, sometimes it's kind of spooky how they come to me. I've had literally occasions where uh, 
short stories actually practically dictate themselves. Uh, so uh, I think they come, I'm a great believer in the unconscious as mm -hmm. part of the creative, and that's probably, you know, obvious self-truism, but uh, one of the things I don't do when I write, which may surprise people, is I do not uh, go to my computer with a preformed story. I just look at that blank page and let it flow. Because if you watch people and you watch the world, the unconscious is doing a lot with that information. That's true. So I just open it up and see what's there. You know, the conscious mind, we have to focus. Survival depends on focus. But that doesn't mean the rest of the brain isn't picking up things. I mean, dreams are kind of evidence of the way the mind kind of picks up those other stories and files them. That's so true. I, I just open up to the filing system to see what's there. Do you have any regrets as a writer? Well, I think we've touched upon that, and that is that I wish I'd have had the guts to take myself seriously. You know, we all have uh, uh, underdogs in us that tell us we can't. And what I want to say to your audience is, well, I turn 76 next month. Wow, no. you're a youngster. Yeah, don't listen to that underdog. Do not ever listen to the word, I can't. Yes, my mother taught me that when I was little. Yeah. We never said the word can't and won't. You mm -hmm. cannot use that word. She always made me believe that I could do anything I want and be anything I wanted. It's, well, like a, it's a form of brainwashing, pretty much. It's true, because you know what? I think we so fulfill our own prophecies. And if you want evidence that whatever it is you want to do, you can do, is take a look at the people who are doing it. And not all of them are great. That's true. You know, so, so take that as your measuring mark. The question is, how much do you want it? How and stay away from negative people, too. I noticed that, too. Oh. <laughs> you got to stay away from people who are negative. Because if you do stay around those people, they'll try to drag you down and tell you you oh. can't do it. And, oh, you're crazy and blah, blah, blah. So you can't stay, you know, stay positive. That's true. And, you know, uh, and, and very often you'll get some of that from your friends. And, uh, and they need to be cut off. Goodbye. I can't be your friend anymore. You're negative. Well... All right, this is a six-year-old woman talking. No, I don't cut them off. I forgive them. Who doesn't have warts, you know? Uh, but the thing is, um, understand that they're having trouble adapting to the change in you. I guess you know, that's a good way of looking at it. You know, they decided that you're this, and now suddenly you say, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm this. And they say, oh, no, no, you're not, because it makes me uncomfortable. So I think we have to kind of forgive them. They're really our friends. Well, I also believe, too, that if you have friends who are negative, they don't think they could do it. So why should they think you could do it? Like, they don't believe that they can't believe that you're actually accomplishing this. So they are going to try to drag you down and be negative. Oh, well, of course, then now we're talking definition. Anybody who 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 treats me like that over an extended period of time, as you say. Is not your friend. Oh, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> not your friend. Yeah, no, we have a right to, to keep our environment as, as but, but no, I'm just saying true friends sometimes will have trouble moving with you. Um, and you just have to forgive that. They're and, stagnant in yeah, their thinking. Yeah, right. So that's. Now, you, you, you probably experience that, too, where a good friend kind of comes from left field and you're wondering, well... Um, they're not around any longer because I don't tolerate that because yeah. I'm moving forward, and if you can't keep up with me, then you get left behind. <laughs> Boy, I'm going to stay out of, I'm of, a moving of your train negative here. area. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a moving train here. <laughs> if you're going to get on the train or get off. That's right. Well, that's true. You know, you've got to have... <laughs> It, well, you know what, that's the whole basis of the society, isn't it? Is that we help each other. That's true. Isn't that why we form societies? That is why. 
You're and right. Sometimes I think, you know, you see what's going on in the world, uh, people kind of forget that. That is true. People aren't really aren't, don't have the unity like people did when I was little. I don't know. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, you're with me, Donna Briggs, on Life Talk, The Big Talker, and Carolyn Miller, published author of Gothic Springs and Heartland. And we'll be right back from a word from our sponsor. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Mary Crafts, and this is how I live united. I've spent the last 24 years running a local catering company, but I felt a huge part of our community was being underserved. So what I do with United Way here in my town is advocate for kids and families that are invisible. I stand up for them and help them grow strong. I volunteer with a program where we go into people's homes and assess mother and infant well-being and help bring change and opportunity into their lives. As a caterer, I make sure people are happy and well-fed. As a United Way advocate, I make sure people, especially kids, have a chance to thrive and succeed. One of these mothers once said to me, Mary, you are making a difference, you know. And I thought, wow, that's worth everything. My name is Mary Crafts, and I don't just wear the shirt. I live it. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Go to liveunited.org. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. Organ donation is the gift of life. Now you can save your own life by agreeing to donate your organs when you die. How? Join Life Sharers. Membership is free. Visit lifesharers.org or call 888-ORGAN-88. Life Sharers puts organ donors first. When you join Life Sharers, you get preferred access to the organs of other members. This could literally save your life. Thousands of Americans die every year waiting for organ transplants. Join Life Sharers today. There's no age limit. Parents can enroll their minor children, and no one is excluded due to any pre-existing medical condition. Call 888-ORGAN-88 or visit lifesharers.org. That's L-I-F-E-S-H-A-R-E-R-S dot org. Life Sharers. It's free. It could save your life. It is with sound mind and body that I, James Fredericks III, after fighting with all direct family members for decades, leave my entire fortune of $32 million to the one friend I had in the end, the package delivery guy, Matt Songer. Woohoo! Yeah! I had a feeling about this. Uh huh. I'm rich! Oh! This cannot be happening. Actually, it's not happening. What? What? And it never will. I don't get it. There aren't even people here. That's just one of those murmuring sound effects. Seriously? Listen, if you want to have money in your future, don't rely on luck. Huh. Put ten bucks away each month. Cook once in a while instead of eating out. Okay. Pay down your high-interest credit cards. Right. Small changes today, big bucks tomorrow. So, no inheritance? Uh, no. Go to FeedThePig.org for more free ideas. Feed the pig. Org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. And just to be clear, no inheritance, right? And now, welcome back to Life Talk with your host, Donna Briggs. We're back. I'm here with Carolyn Miller, author of the book, Gothic Springs and Heartland. How are you doing, Carolyn? I'm still here, Donna. Great. We made it to the first half hour, didn't we? <laughs> Can we women talk or what? Yes! <laughs> You're a great interviewer. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, so, I, wanted, I have a I question. To, go, ahead, go ahead. What sets your books apart, Gothic Springs, from other books in the Gothic genre? Well, of course, I, as I say, I think one of the things is is the advantage of hindsight. Mm-hmm. Looking back to see how women were treated. There's one little dialogue in my book, for example, where um, the, the, the Victorian uh, vicar's wife it takes this 16-year-old girl under her wing and um, tries to coach her on what it is to be a real woman. I, I've got the little paragraph. I won't read the whole thing, but it, 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 she's, it, so the girl says, well, don't you have a duty to yourself? And the, and the woman says, 
a duty to oneself? I, I don't know what that means. We we aren't living in a world of, of avoid, Victorine. Hmm. Uh, you know, we if you were a boy, this conversation would be different. But as you're not, well, then I want you to learn the benefits of your feminine heritage. A good wife works for a husband's success and for that of her children. Well, of course, that's still a good value system. It is a good value system, but a lot of men don't think like that now. But but it can't be the only system because, as you pointed out, we're not cookie-cutter people and cookie-cutter, living cookie-cutter lives. That's true. And, and, and society has changed dramatically. Right. Men don't look at women the same way. A lot of men want someone who's doing something. It's not sitting around waiting on them, you know. Mm-hmm. Some guys want that. Mm-hmm. That's so, right. So you uh, never know. You, you, you never know. But um, I, this is a little beyond the realm of books, but I do want it, since I'm an old ERA girl, I do want women not to fall into the trap of meeting the new male norm of what a woman is. I mean, I went to see The Dark Knight yesterday. And, and what did you think of that movie? It's, it was three hours long, I tell you. They, they, it's not meant for my hips, I'll tell you. But, it's, <laughs> but, but, but in any case, the, the new heroines are really kind of men dressed up with bras. And, you know, I, I just... That's interesting. I think we women really, really still are working and searching to find what it is to be truly feminine, to be a woman. Uh, and too often we fall into these traps of picking up the male signals. You know, there was a time, for example, and, and, and Donna, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this, where if you wanted to be in the business world, you had to wear a gray suit. Or try to fit in any way right. you could. Right. And, and um, I think women have, like the Chinese, the yin and the yang, our, our role isn't to follow the male expectations, but create our half of the world so there's balance. I mean, there's a lot of testosterone going on in this world. That's true. But, on the women's end also. Well, I, you know, <laughs> I, yeah, I want to caution my, my, my females, really, darlings, is this where we want to go? You know, do I want to kick the brains out of somebody in a judo match? Is that what I mean by being a woman? Uh, I, I'm not, I don't, I can't give any woman her answer. I'm just saying, but please, would you ask the question, uh, is this your view of femininity or is it going to be another masculine v- view? You know, they say, oh, oh you want to be free? Okay, then you can kickbox like me. So uh, what do you think about the males being more feminine than they used to be? Well, I don't know what it says. You know, one of the things, I, I, I love men and I've got some... But I tell you, I, 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 you know, that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. I, that guy really kind of touched on it. It's very hard for me sometimes to understand. Um, but I, so, so, so the question is, we got to live in this world with 50% of the population male. Do we want the other 50% to be male-like? Hmm, that's heavy. So that's and you the, see that a lot nowadays. You see a lot of women are... Um, more like men. They don't, you know, I guess they don't know their role, I guess. Yeah. But a lot of men aren't expecting women to be that feminine. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm just raising the question here as we're chatting, since Gothic Spring is all about what is, it raises a question, what, you know, what is a woman's destiny? What is her role? Where do you see it going, the women's destiny? I think, uh, I don't know where it's going. I, I think, I, I just want women to raise the question. What I'm afraid of is that the popular culture is already beginning to, to impose a new role on women. And it's not one that's to women's advantage because now we used to be protected homemakers. Now we're protect, we're not, we're unprotected homemakers and champions of the, the, the market and competition and, um, you know, it, it, I, I don't think women can walk both sides of the street successfully, or rather, I don't think they should. I guess that is true, because think about it. If like My grandmother, she was a homemaker. She took mm-hmm. care of my granddad, and, mm-hmm. you know, 
she wasn't really she wasn't out there, you know, corporate CEO taking care mm-hmm. of kids. Like now men expect you to be the corporate CEO and mm-hmm. come home, take care of the kids mm-hmm. and make sure the house is clean. Exactly. I mean, how many I I love to read women's like, magazines. Like, okay. Women's <laughs> magazines will really pull up the mirror of life to you. And how many of those what's wrong with this marriage is about the woman who says, "I'm working out there in the field with my husband, but he won't really help you know he'll take out the garbage but you know the laundry isn't his thing or you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so uh, in some ways we're in very exciting times as it's very a very fluid world and we can define ourselves um i just say you know that's going to take a lot more thinking because it isn't defined anymore exciting but certainly challenging Yes, it's no definition. The The lines are blurred. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So as we become women and take our role in society, I, I just hope that we'll bring a different voice. I, I, I don't know whether you've got time. It's a quick little story. Was, oh, yeah, was, go ahead. Tell it. I want to use love stories. Well, this is a woman that was lecturing. I picked her up on uh, the video. Mm-hmm. Somebody sent it to me, and she's a top CEO somewhere. And so she was lecturing to this group of women, and she, was, she said, I walked into this business meeting, and all the men were at the table, and, and, and the other three women that were in the room, they were sitting at the back with their back to the wall. And I tried to get them to come to the table, and they wouldn't. And she said, no, if you, if you keep that attitude up, you're never going to advance. Well, you know, I had a very different take on that. Hmm. I, I thought, you know, she isn't listening to what it is to be feminine. Sometimes one can lead from behind. But those women were in the room and participating in a very different way than me first competition. They were taking a supportive role, but that that doesn't have to be uh, background. It's a new way of looking, and it's saying to the world, can we cooperate? Can we share? Can we keep our egos in check? And can we work together? And so I didn't see that situation. I thought the women were behaving in this beautiful way that women do, which is to be capable of sharing the limelight. Yes. So you think today's new woman doesn't really share the limelight well with their spouse or male figures, or do you think that's why the men are more feminine now, because the women are more masculine? Well, I don't know. I I don't know, uh, Donna. I don't, you know, I'm agreeing with you. I'm really asking that question. Are women, are are we becoming more masculine now that we're free? And I'm saying, wait, ladies, you know, there's something about compassion and love. There's something about checking the ego at the door that women do very well and let's not throw that away that's true but it's kind of hard to put that at the door when all day you're running an office you're a president of a company you're a ceo or you're doing what you're doing so you come to the door and you have to be submissive or something or be a different person it's true but you have to have to and again i guess this is old age talking you have to really kind of put that consciousness into what you're doing. You know, I worked as a commissioner. I was an elected official at a, at a, at a county here in my state. And for the first time in history, five women got elected to that board. Wow. Never heard of, all at once. And we, now we had our personal differences and our stylish, but we had common goals which was to take care of children and the elderly and not to build a jail for some every darn offense in the world, Uh, to go at it at the early stage, taking care of pregnant, uh, unwed mothers who are likely to raise a child in poverty, dealing with it at that end of the stream instead of waiting until the, the kid became a criminal, and we now have to resurrect jail. Yeah, and it's too late by that time. And we really took on society, and society was really mad at us. All the power brokers were mad at us, but we stuck to our guns, 
And, you know, those five women, we five women, worked together so well and made some significant changes. And I remember one day somebody, a man, a leader in the community, came up after we were having a debate about a child care. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, he said, this is the way government should work. That was a revelation for him. Yes. And if, <laughs> and if it works right, people wouldn't hate it so much. That's true. Because, you know, what is government except that umbrella, which we have all agreed to, to live under, uh, to share with one another? You're right. And we'll, we'll be right back with a word from our sponsor. We're here with Carolyn Miller and book author. We'll be back. Hands can do incredible things. This is the sound of 326 hands playing Mozart. This is the sound of 10,942 hands showing appreciation. 64 hands building a house for the homeless. 142 hands swimming a triathlon. 18 hands winning the big game. And this is the sound of two hands helping to save a life. It's called Hands Only CPR, and it's recommended by the American Heart Association. If an adult suddenly collapses, call 911, then push hard and fast in the center of their chest until help arrives. It's incredibly easy and effective. Hands can do incredible things, but nothing compares to using them to help save a life. Find out more about this latest method of CPR at handsonlycpr.org. A message from the American Heart Association and the Ad Council. Is there really such a thing as a safe place to put your money? And where would that be? Under the mattress? Stuffed in a cookie jar? No, no, no. You want real safety? Find out about the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC. It protects your money. Up to $250,000 in bank accounts, like checking, savings, and CDs. And talk about solid. In 75 years, no one has ever lost a penny of FDIC-insured money. Better odds than your cookie jar. So if you have $250,000 or less in any one FDIC-insured bank, you have no need to worry. Your money is fully protected. If you have more or aren't sure, visit FDIC.gov or call 1-877-ASK-FDIC. The more you know, the safer your money. My name is Sue Smith. I'm 38 years old, and I work at a graphic design company, which is funny because I couldn't even draw a stick figure when I was a kid. But I met someone who told me, you know what, you can do anything if you really want to. And if the teenage me were here, she'd tell you, I wouldn't be into drawing and art if it wasn't for big brothers, big sisters. Most kids from my neighborhood don't get into art. They get into trouble. But I was lucky because my big sister showed me early on that I didn't have to be like most people. And to the young me, that meant a lot. My big sister's name is Sheila, and Sheila is the reason that this eight-year-old grows up to have an amazing job as a graphic designer. Whether you donate money or time, you're helping big brothers, big sisters help a child. And that can last a lifetime. Start something today at BigBrothersBigSisters.org. Brought to you by Big Brothers Big Sisters and the Ad Council. And now, welcome back to Life Talk with your host, Donna Briggs. We're back. I'm here with Carolyn Miller, published author of the book Gothic Springs and Heartland. How you doing, Carolyn? I'm still hanging in. I can't Great. believe I talked for 45 minutes. <laughs> yes. Donna, I'm, you... I'm, I'm, what, you know, I'm really great. <laughs> yes, you are. You <laughs> underestimate yourself here. Now, tell our listeners a little bit about you. Tell my, now, honey, one of the things you did was hire a 70, I'm not hire, but I invite <laughs> a 76-year-old woman here. Say that again slowly. What would you like the audience to know about Carolyn Miller? Oh, okay. Well, I'm a great writer, mm -hmm. <laughs> great talker, and um, but uh, I think what I would like people to know is that um, I came from uh, a background. My mom 
was Costa Rican Mm -hmm. and came as an immigrant to this country. And I uh, grew up in Los Angeles in the 1940s where there was a lot of racial prejudice against Latinos. And so I suffered a lot of prejudice and uh, was, was a poor kid like most of the people on this planet. But, you know, uh, my mom was, I want to give her credit for inculcating like your mom did. Mm-hmm. You know, you can do it, to, you know, to get up and do it. Um, so I would like to say to your audience that, uh, you know, I, I, I was not born with a spoon, silver spoon in my life, just like they are, you are, you people out there, wonderful people listening. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, you can make demands of life by having high expectations for yourself. Yes, and a lot of people I notice don't set the bar high enough. There you or go. they don't believe that they can do it, so they make it, you know, like it's funny, I started my media company over a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. So I film, I'm certified in film, editing, production, and I just did this in the past year. Wow. Yeah. Hey. I should be interviewing you. <laughs> no, it's funny, but if people are saying, oh, well, you never went to school for journalism. You never went to school for communications. You can't have a radio show. You can't do this. You can't do that. So I just don't listen to people. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Of course you can. I mean, you're a living example. Uh, I, 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 here's, here's the thing for, for people to remember that what they may see in you is a success. Mm-hmm. What they don't see are all the times you got up and picked yourself up. That's true. All but the- actually, for me, that didn't really happen much. Usually, if I try something, it usually works. Right. So I don't really have too many, like, sad pity party stories. <laughs> usually, yeah. it works. I'm like, oh, I did it. It worked. Hey. You know, I, when I, uh, in my early days, I used to teach school, and, and these kids would, would, you know, not want to change, not want to take the risk in their writing and all of these things. Mm-hmm. And, and I, and, you know, oh, it might fail. Well, you know what? So if what? Look at scientists. How many experiments fail before they find the right drug? That's true. You know, failure is a step on the road to success. Yes, because sometimes you have to go backwards to go forward. And a lot of people are not willing to go backwards. Absolutely. Uh, you know, going back, what was that, Chinese? I don't know whether it's really Chinese. But, you, know, <laughs> you take one step backwards to go two steps forwards or whatever. Yeah, people, um, failure is not a bad thing. No, it's, it's not. It's, it's learning. And, in fact, we can't learn unless we fail. If everything is a success, we don't know what made it a success. That's true. Now, I started a... To my like I said, my media company, and I did a TV show. It's called Donna's World. Uh-huh. So I'm revamping it over again because it wasn't the greatest show in the world, but I tried it, I produced it, I did the editing, and I'm redoing it. Uh-huh. But the fact that I actually tried it, people were, like, shocked that I actually did it and actually got it on TV. They're like, how did you do that? Uh-huh. Exactly. Now, imagine, uh, as I used to say to my students, imagine you're a toddler, Mm-hmm. Now, and you fall on your skin, skin your knees. What would your life be life if, after that painful experience, you crawled back in the crib and never came out again? That's true. I think that's a bad thing. You know, so yeah. um, we mustn't be. It doesn't feel good. If failure feels good, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> but, well, some people expect to fail too. That's another thing I notice. Or they're disappointed when they're successful. Some people are so used to brainwash themselves to failing uh-huh. when they're successful they it throws them off well, they're you know, scared of success or something the, the, the thing is and 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 donna we we both know this is true the thing about success is that there are always trade-offs you know uh, you get where you want you have this illusion of what it is you want but it's not quite what you want no uh, you know there are there are other things that come with it that uh, I, I remember, you know, I have a great empathy for people like yourselves who kind of put yourself out there in this in this 
popular media mm-hmm. where everybody knows you, you know, everybody knows your And name. it's kind of weird. Like, it's I don't know weird. these. And they come up to you, you don't know the person, and yeah. you have to always be on your P's and Q's, how you're acting because people are watching you. And yeah. if you're yeah. not in the media, you really don't, you know, you don't really have to do that. But if you I- are, people are like, you know, I met that Donna Briggs and she exactly. uh, she cut me off. <laughs> okay, right. That's what I mean. So you think that fame is important, but how 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 important is privacy to you? That's you know, true. That's a big I think you give that up. Off. You give that up. Yeah, it's a, and 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 the other one, of course. And I fact, I just wrote a blog on that. Everybody, Caroline Miller Books, CarolineMillerBooks dot com. Yes, and me. give them all your information. <laughs> But I wrote a blog the mm-hmm. other day about uh, the problem with our bottom line society is we've forgotten we we mistake wealth for money, but wealth is relationships. That's true. People who pick you up when you're down. A dollar bill isn't going to do that, or no. a hundred dollar bill isn't going to do that. So. Um, so when everybody is striving for success, they think it's money. It isn't. And so sometimes when they get to their notion of success, it doesn't feel it's right. It's delusional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. people say they want success, but they're not willing to put the time in or the effort in or the whatever they have to put in to actually make it a success. Because it takes a lot to build up anything. Anything you do, it takes a lot to do it. People are like, oh, I want to do that. Oh, I want to have a radio show, and I want to have a TV show. But do you want to go to class, learn how to do the lights, the editing, the filming, uh, production? Do you want to call people up, do interviews? I mean, it's a lot that goes into it. Exactly. You know, I, 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 I you're, you're just saying it so beautifully, and I just hope somebody is here. Because, <laughs> people because... say they want it, but they really don't want it. They don't want to put the time in. Donna, wouldn't it be wonderful if we actually changed somebody's heart and mind today uh, so that they reappraised uh, the direction of their life? Wouldn't that wouldn't That we, would be great, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that justify our I existence? think someone is touched in our audience right now. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. never know. You, you never do. And, and, and uh, like with me, you know, I, uh, after politics, I just, you know, politics is an acid bath. Uh, you I would to, never go into politics. I just think yeah. that's all. I mean, I have too much to uh, say, and I'm too opinionated. I might, you know, step on somebody's toes or something. I don't know. Well, the, the thing <laughs> is, you know, it, m- politics is so driven by money that you have to sell yourself. And anybody who's been in politics a long time and they can come and argue with me, they've lost themselves because you just can't afford to be in politics unless you sell little pieces of yourself and and and. But but I won't go there. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I left that platform. So, but the point is, so I came to writing. I thought, oh gosh, just me and my computer. What bliss! Mm-hmm. Oh, Donna, I have five people help me manage my website, my computer. That's my, impressive. Yeah. Well, no, it just means I'm awfully dumb. And no, <laughs> I mean that's good that you had. You know, it's it's hard to find good help. First of all. That yeah. you can have actually five people that you can depend on. That's right. amazing to me. That's amazing. Because it's so hard to find dependable people who have the work ethic that you yeah. can actually depend yeah. on. Yeah. But, I mean, imagine that. Five people. just now, And now I have to write this book. And now I have to promote this book. And so, as we said at the beginning, which is probably a nice way to circle this program, is that the thing you want to do is only the it's not even the frosting on the cake. It's the maraschino cherry, you know? Yes. Uh, and you're right, Donna. Uh, if you want it, you're going to pay all those different prices. Some you know, some you don't know. That's true. Yeah. And so. I, we had a wonderful time. This is a great interview. I loved it. Well, because I've got a great interviewer. Oh, oh. stop. And we can also contact you at carolynmiller.com. And uh, check books, out your books. Yeah. Books by Caroline Miller. Mm-hmm. Dot com. It's Caroline, C-A-R-O-L-I-N-E, not with a Y. And I, I would love to hear from your folks. All right. And thanks for joining us. You've been with the Life Talk, the big talker on 
1580 a.m. Remember, make every day a great day. See you next week. You've been listening to the most popular show on radio, Life Talk, with your host, Donna Briggs. For contact information, you can email Donna at dbriggsmedia at me.com. 